How are you today? Good to see you. I love coming into the season. I love seeing so many people bring in their Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes to church this morning. Thank you for that. Thank you for participating in the digital build. I love this aspect. It's just a whole wonderful way to add to our worship experience to do it as unto the Lord and to do it as a group. So thank you for participating. Um, I have to be the bearer of bad news to you this morning. I bet you were hoping and you heard that Eric Metaxas was coming to speak here from New York City. Eric called in sick, and uh, I got the message that he would, could not come when I was in London, England. That's where I've been all week and uh, doing a conference there, and Eric called in sick. So uh, just in case Eric Metaxas is watching this uh, broadcast, I'm really bitter. No, I'm just kidding. But I really am. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. But uh, so he couldn't be uh, here. He wanted to be here. In fact, Eric was scheduled to speak at another church. When I invited him to come and speak this weekend, he called the other church to see if he could get out of that commitment or reschedule it so he could be here because he loves coming here. And uh, his message to me was, please, you know, give me another shot. So I'm still bitter, but... No, we'll, we'll def definitely have Eric back. So that's the bad news. But I'm prepared to preach the good news to you. Is that okay? So if you don't mind, please take your Bible. Did you bring one? Good, good. Let's turn in those Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I want to talk to you about what it means to be a disciple. So... Uh, I was at a conference in London, England that I was asked to speak at by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, and it was an assembly of several hundred pastors from the London area, uh, some from Germany and other places, but mostly England and mostly London. And uh, what blew me away is how many people there walked up to me and said, hey, we watch you every week online. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're, we listen either on radio or we watch on YouTube or whatever outlets we have available. But uh, it reminded me of what it just was a stark reminder of the impact that you as a church are making around the world. And I was reminded of what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians when he said, from you, the word of the Lord sounded forth everywhere. So that was pretty exciting. And then I was speaking on this topic that I want to share with you today, and I just saw how it resonated so much with the leadership there. And it, it dawned on me how core and crucial this message is, that being a disciple of Jesus Christ, being a follower of Christ, is a core essential of our identity. You know, I am a pastor, I am an author, I'm a grandpa, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, um, I'm a motorcyclist, I'm a lot of things, but first and foremost, at the top of the list, I am a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is my identity. And uh, we all have an identity, and people can usually tell our at least partial identity just when they meet us. So if you meet someone on the street today and they come up to you with a British accent and you, they say, hello, how are you? You're going to know immediately, they ain't from around here, right? That they have an identity that they are from another place. And uh, we even have our own accents here in the United States. If somebody comes with a long, drawn-out southern accent, you know they're not from the West Coast. And also in England, you know, when I was in England... They love American accents like we love British accents. Go figure. And I was in a camera store, and I was talking to a guy, and he said, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from the United States. He said, well, I know that, but which one? And I said, I'm from New Mexico. And he goes, you sound like you're from California. <laughs> so um, I don't exactly know what that meant, but it's the second time that that has happened to me, that people can figure out part of your identity by the way you talk, and then, of course, by the way you live. So I want to talk about being a disciple, following Jesus Christ. And 
our Lord told his followers, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. He didn't say, go make converts of all nations. He didn't say, go make congregants of all nations. Though those are part of being a disciple, no doubt. But he said, go and make disciples of all nations. The 12 men that were around Jesus in his ministry all would have understood clearly what being a disciple meant. They understood that discipleship in that era meant that you follow a rabbi, that you listen to the rabbi's instruction, that you actually hang out and walk around with and follow literally that rabbi to see how that rabbi puts those truths into action. Not just what he says with his lips, but what he lives with his life. So that they too would become like that. Now, I am of the opinion that Jesus Christ has a lot of fans, but not as many followers as you might think. There's a big difference between being a fan and a follower. I grew up in a church environment as a kid. I was a fan of Jesus. Yeah, gee, I like him. I'm a, I'm a fan. But as time went on, I became less of a fan. Still a fan, but less of a fan. It was my parents' religion. I wasn't really interested in church. I didn't want to get that much into it. But then there was that time in my life where I actually encountered Jesus and asked him into my life, and I became a disciple of Jesus, a follower, not just a fan. One of the problems we have with language is that meanings of words change over time. Um, you could say, I like you. Uh, that used to mean something, and today it means something different. So when you say, uh, like us on Facebook, right, that's a whole different kind of like, or follow me on Instagram. It's a whole different kind of following than what Jesus meant. Um, I remember when uh, somebody who was young, the first time I heard this phrase, and they looked at something that I was looking at, and they said, man, that's bad. And I said, what, what, really, what's wrong with it? He goes, no, 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 it's bad. I said, I know, what's so bad about it? What's wrong with it? And he goes, and he had to explain, no, bad now means good. It means the very opposite of what it originally meant. And then somebody else said, man, that's really sick. And I'm thinking unhealthy, ill. So no, no, no. Sick is a word that means it's really cool, it's really good. So we live in a day and age when uh, bad means good and sick means great and awesome means nothing. <laughs> what does it mean to follow, to really follow Jesus Christ? Well, in Matthew chapter 16, we have Jesus' own definition of a follower. And when he said, follow me to his men, he didn't mean follow me on Instagram and push the like button. He meant something different. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We're going to spend the bulk of our attention today on that one verse. He continues, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. You will notice that in verse 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, you just notice the word, mathetes is the Greek word, mathetes, follower, disciple, learner, somebody who receives instruction. Did you know that the very first term, designation, for Christians was not Christian? And it wasn't believer. 
the very first title for a Christian in the New Testament is the term disciple. They are called disciples, disciples, disciples in all four Gospels. By the time you get to the book of Acts, the very first time Christian comes up in Acts 11:26, we are told, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now that little phrase tells us two things, that the term Christian was another term given, and it was probably a derogatory term, not a nice term, and that the original term for a believer or a follower or a Christian was that they were disciples, a disciple of Jesus Christ. So if you are going to follow Jesus, if you are going to be a disciple, you have to come to him on his terms. And these are his terms. I'm going to give you his terms. I want to show you five steps in discipleship. First is the step of desire the step of desire. Somebody decides they want to become a follower of Christ. You'll notice in verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me. What does that mean, desires to come after me? It's very simple. If you want to become a Christian, if you want to be a follower of Christ, if anyone desires to come after me. That's the first step desire. Um, everything in life happens based upon our desire or somebody else's desire and decision. Everything begins with a desire. There would be no progress in the world without desire. There would be no advancements in the world without desire. So you get up in the morning and you experience hunger and now you have a desire to do something about your hunger. It's called breakfast. And you, uh, you make a decision based upon your desire, what you're going to put in your mouth and chew on. It could be a piece of toast. It could be oatmeal. It could be Fruit Loops. It could be something as disgusting as Vegemite, like they do in Australia. Uh, but it's all, all predicated upon your personal desire. And because that personal desire won't end at breakfast, but you're probably going to have another desire later on in the day and then later on in the evening, lunch and dinner, and because you're going to probably have that same set of desires not just one day, but every day of your life, you're going to need to get a job to support your habit of eating food, right? So, so all of that is driven by our desire. Salvation also begins with desire, at least from a human standpoint. Predestination notwithstanding, election notwithstanding, from a human point of view, our salvation begins with our desire. That is, we discover that we have a need and we crave a different way of life. We desire that. Our desire might begin with guilt. We're aware of our sin. We want our sins forgiven. That drives us to desire the salvation that comes through Christ. For others, the desire begins with emptiness. My life is unfulfilling. I've tried a lot of things. I'm not satisfied by all the activities in my life. There's got to be something more. For still others, the desire might begin with a yearning. We get a little bit older, we start thinking about not just having fun, but we start thinking about our own mortality, that we're going to die, and we would love to believe that you can have the assurance of life after death, and that yearning drives you to ask Jesus to come and be your Savior. All of those things, whether it's guilt or emptiness or yearning, all of those things are God-given. So that will desire Him. Listen to what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8. He said, all of creation was subjected to futility or emptiness. Creation was subjected to futility or condemned to frustration, as the NIV puts it, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Uh, let me translate that a little more easier. God put a hole in your soul. God put a hole in your soul so that you would know it's there. 
and you would desire to have that hole filled. Some years ago, an American psychologist named Abraham Maslow discovered this concept, but he called it the hierarchy of human need. He said that all human beings have desires, and they're classified into five areas. First is the desire to live. That goes back to that breakfast analogy. I'm hungry, I gotta feed myself, I really want to live. That's the first basic desire. It is purely physiological. The second is safety. Once I'm alive, I wanna protect my life. So I wanna make sure that I've got uh, uh, people that are watching my back and protecting me and a police force and a military. All of that sense of security is important as a need. Third is the desire to belong and to love. Fourth, to be recognized by others, that I'm making a contribution, making an impact. And then number five, and on his little chart, is, it's at the very top, it's the very peak of the pyramid, is fulfillment. Fulfillment. I have a desire to be everything I am meant to be, to be completed. So God knows this. And God knows that you and I will never be fulfilled, never be complete until we come to Christ. So he puts guilt and he puts emptiness and he puts yearning in us. So it'll drive us to desire him and we will be complete. Without desire, there's no discipleship because without desire, there's no decision. So that's, that's the first step. If you desire to come after him for whatever reason. That leads us then to the second step. After the step of desire is the step of denial. Denial. Here's Jesus saying, you want some of this? You want salvation? You desire to follow me? You really desire to be a disciple? All right, here's the terms. Second step, let him deny himself. The word means disown himself could be translated that. Let him disown himself. Let him repudiate himself. Let him separate himself. Let him refuse any association or companionship with himself. Well, what, what does that mean exactly? How do you deny yourself? How do you disown yourself? How do you separate from yourself? Because last time I checked, wherever you go, there you are. You don't ever get away from yourself. By the way, when Jesus said, deny yourself, it's the same word used of Peter when he denied Jesus Christ. I don't even know the man. So Jesus said, do that with yourself. Deny yourself. Now, in explaining what this means, there's something I want you to notice. Notice Jesus does not say uh, he must deny things for himself. He is not suggesting that you deny yourself a chocolate bar after church or that you deny yourself a nice vacation that you've been saving for or that during a season we call Lent, you have to deny eating certain things or doing certain things. That's a practice that I grew up with. He's not talking about that. He's saying, no, I'm not saying deny things for yourself. I'm saying deny yourself. You could translate that your flesh, your self-life, your selfishness. Things like self-fulfillment, self-importance, self-indulgence, self-will, self-sufficiency. This is selfish living. So when you desire to follow Christ, you are giving up the right, listen, you're giving up the right to run your own life yourself. It's like hands off the steering wheel. You give, you give the pink slip to him. You surrender yourself to an alien will, the will of God, not your own. Denying yourself is the opposite of independence, which is very hard for an American to hear because we base our whole existence as a nation on our independence. And I just came back from England. And, uh, um, you know, they kind of look at us like we're a bunch of rebels. And, and we are, right? That's how this nation was founded. We rebelled against the authority of the king. We wanted our independence. 
And uh, we Americans love our independence, uh, and uh, we talk about it, some of us, a lot. You know, I'm independent from the government, government overreach, and all that kind of stuff that is going on now. That, that'll work on an earthly level, but don't dare try that when it comes to a heavenly government. When it comes to the heavenly government, there's no declaration of independence. There's only a declaration of dependence. That's denying yourself. You're not independent. You are now dependent on him. There's an article that I found and kept. It was written by an American businessman. And it's appropriately titled, The Art of Being a Big Shot, by Howard Butt. And he writes this. It's my pride that makes me independent of God. It's appealing to me to feel that I am the master of my fate, that I run my own life, that I call my own shots, that I go it alone. When I am conceited, I am lying to myself about what I am. I am pretending to be God and not man. My pride is the idolatrous worship of myself, and that is the national religion of hell. Let me remind you of what Paul the Apostle wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He said, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. God paid blood for you, the blood of his son. And in having his son die on the cross, it was his stake of ownership over your life and over your future. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. So if you have a desire to follow me, Jesus said, uh, you don't own you any longer. You have turned over the pink slip. I am now driving the car. So that's the first two steps, the step of desire, the step of denial, but notice what else he says. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Now, I have to give context to this little phrase, take up his cross. Because when we hear it today, we hear it very differently than how the disciples heard it 2,000 years ago. When Jesus talked about a cross, they knew exactly what he was talking about. But we have misinterpreted this over time. I've heard all crazy things sorts of crazy things as to what it means to bear your cross, uh, all, everything from your mother-in-law to your wife or your husband or your job or your pastor or your whatever it might be. Just, it, it, we have reduced cross-bearing to going through a trial or an inconvenience. Well, it's my cross to bear. When Jesus said, you have to bear your cross, the disciples had in mind only one thing, capital punishment. They had seen crucifixion. They had seen hundreds of people, thousands of people. It's estimated that the Romans crucified 30,000 people during the lifetime of Christ. So they, they had seen on multiple occasions. There's, history books are filled with insurrections that were put down by the Romans and the Romans responded by crucifying up to 2,000 on one day, people on crosses that lined the roads. And often the criminals would bear the upper part of the cross, that cross beam, the patibulum. They, they put that on their back and they'd march down the street with that patibulum. And that's what it meant to bear a cross. It means go to the place of public execution and die. It wasn't a piece of jewelry you put on your neck or an icon you stick on top of a church building. For Jesus to say, if you're going to come after me, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross. It's like saying to us, you have to deny yourself and take up your electric chair. You have to deny yourself and take up your lethal injection. Or you have to deny yourself and take up your hangman's noose, whatever is used for public execution. So, it doesn't mean you're going to go through a trial or a time of inconvenience. But if you're going to, be, if you're going to follow me, if that's what you want, then you deny you, you deny yourself, self-life, you deny the flesh, and you must be willing to die. Now, let me, let me explain further what this means. I want you to go back to a conversation right before this so you get the context. Go back to verse 21. 
Uh, let, let me just fill in the blanks. Jesus had taken his disciples up to a place called Caesarea Philippi. It's way up in the north. It's much cooler than Galilee. In the summer, Galilee can be swelteringly hot. You get up to Caesarea Philippi, it's about 25 miles north, and it's probably 20 degrees cooler. It's very mild. It's beautiful. And uh, he said, hey, um, let me ask you a question. Who do men say that I am? And he said, oh, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So Peter's the only guy who gets an A on the test. And so verse 21, Matthew 16, verse 21, look at that verse with me. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. I personally believe they did not hear that last part. Once he said, I'm going to die, they heard nothing else. Because that is not what they expected. Their messianic expectation is that the Messiah is going to live and conquer everyone and set up the kingdom, and we're going to reign with him. He says, let me let you in on the plan, boys. It's not going to go like you think it's going to go. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. It's going to get pretty gnarly. I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to get messed up, and I'm going to be killed. But I'm going to be raised the third day. They didn't hear that part, and here's proof. Then Peter took him aside. Here's Peter. You know, Peter's feeling really good right now because he aced the test. He's the guy who said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Maybe he's feeling infallible. I don't know at this point. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. There's Peter being all big and in charge, and we're not going to let this happen. What's interesting is what Jesus said. He turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Wow. Okay, I mean, you know, I, you could call me like, you could say, you could just say bug off. <laughs> get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Why on earth would Jesus use such harsh language with his friend, Peter? Here's why. Peter's trying to stop Jesus from the very purpose he came to earth for. The very reason he came to earth was to die on that cross. Jesus is called the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. He came for that. Now Peter, listen, Peter is suggesting Christianity without the cross crossless Christianity. A lot of people want that. Oh, they want to follow Christ. They just don't want a cross. They don't want the cross. And so Peter suggests, hey, let's get rid of the cross. And the reason he said, get behind me, Satan, is because a few years before when Jesus began his ministry and, and our Lord was out in the wilderness, it says he was tempted by the devil. And the devil came to him and he said, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world if you'll just bow down and worship me. In other words, I know why you're here. You came to buy back the world to the Father. I know about your mission and your purpose. You don't have to go the way of the cross. I'll give it to you. You can bypass the pain. You can bypass the suffering. You can bypass the death of the cross if you'll just indulge me for a moment and bow down and worship me. So when Peter says, far be it from you, Lord, we're not going to let this happen to you, he said, get behind me, Satan. In other words, I recognize that voice. I know where that philosophy is coming from. Get behind me, Satan, for you're not thinking like God thinks. You're thinking like man thinks. Christianity without a cross is not Christianity. It's just a cheap substitute. Now, it was that conversation that prompted Jesus giving the terms of discipleship because right after verse 23 is verse what? 24. Very good. You aced math. Because <laughs> it says, then, 
Then Jesus said to his disciples, it follows that. After that conversation, then he said, hey, if anyone desires to follow me, he has to deny himself and take up his cross. Look, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. And he didn't spell out the cross, but they knew that capital punishment was often on a cross. So he said, if you're going to follow me, you have to also be willing to take up your cross and follow me. The hymnist in 1690 wrote, Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. The consecrated cross I'll bear till death shall set me free and then go home my crown to wear for there's a crown for me. You get a crown, but you don't get a crown without a cross. If you want to wear the crown, you bear the cross. That's part of discipleship. What begins with desire and includes denial takes us on a death march. It's, in other words, I'm ending my life of self and starting a new life of sacrifice and service. Sacrifice and service. Remember Romans 12? Remember how Paul begins that beautiful chapter? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You know, a living sacrifice is very unpredictable. Dead sacrifices are pretty easy. You just kill the animal, plop it on the altar, it's over. But a living sacrifice where the creature doesn't die, that's our lives. We're to be a living sacrifice. The problem with a living sacrifice is it tends to want to squirm off the altar. We've all had the experience, Lord, I give you my life, everything, absolute surrender, till the next day. And we get pulled back and we start reconsidering and we find that we need to make a recommitment. So to take up the cross, to die to oneself and take up the cross may mean that you have to abandon a personal ambition or a personal goal or a place to live or a certain possession, or a relationship, or a career. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Eric Metaxas, who should have been here today, <laughs> wrote a book on Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in his book, Cost of Discipleship, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. How's that for a quote? When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. So the step of desire and denial and the step of death. Here's a fourth step, the step of devotion. For he continues, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And follow me. It's not like you just come to, and then, oh, okay, here it is. I'm just laying it on, I'm dead. No, no. Okay, now get up and follow me. Follow me. Follow means walk the same road as me. Walk the same road. In ancient times, discipleship was like an internship. It was like an apprenticeship. You'd follow the guy around. You'd watch what the guy did. You took in practical instruction. But it was more than a transfer of information. It was a total transformation. There would be life change as you hear the words being spoken, and as you put them into practice, and as you watch the master, you start becoming like the master. Matthew 10, 25, Jesus said, it is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher. So this is what it means. All the Bible study we engage in, all the church attendance we engage in, all the small group involvement we uh, get into, all of it has a goal, and the goal is to be a better disciple. The goal is to be a fuller follower, is to be someone conformed to the truths that we spend so much time considering and studying him. Discipleship, then, is inviting Jesus to be a part of every day life, every activity in life. You take him with you on vacation. You don't just leave him at church. It's not like visiting. It's Sunday. I'm going to go hang out with Jesus for an hour, but then the rest of the week is mine. No, you, you, you do life with him. 
So just ask yourself this, is there any place you go, anything you watch, where if you knew Jesus was standing right next to you, you'd be embarrassed? Do you ever say, Lord, let's walk this road together because I'm your disciple. But wait, 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 we're at a crossroads. Would you just stay right here? I'll be back in about an hour. There's a couple things I want to do. Then we'll get back together. Then we'll keep going. Our discipleship is you follow him. There's a, a book put out a few years back. Listen to the title. The title uh, will grab you and you'll want to read it. It's called Your Church is Too Safe. Your Church is Too Safe. And in this book, the author Mark Buchanan writes about the difference between a traveler and a tourist. And he explains the meaning of the words. He tells us that the word traveler is a word that literally means travailer. That's where the word traveler comes from. One who travails, one who labors, one who suffers. And as a traveler, he immerses himself in a culture, or she does. Uh, they learn the language, they dress and try to fit into the lifestyle completely. Um, they eat whatever is set before them, and they're gone a long time. That's a traveler. That's different than a tourist. And he explains the word tourist literally means somebody who goes in circles. A tourist is different than a traveler. A tourist will go to a place, but only briefly, just passing through, just sampling the food, not enough to, like, get into it all. Just buying a souvenir, just taking a snapshot, buying a T-shirt and going home. Are you a tourist as a disciple? A tourist disciple or a traveler? A traveler. Follow me. Follow me. Let me take you to the fifth and final step in our message, and that is the step of destiny. So we have desire, denial, death, devotion, and now destiny. For look at how he puts it in verse 25. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Now I want you to notice something. Notice back in verse 25, it says, for whoever, what? There's that word again, desires. The same as in verse 24. Verse 24, if anyone desires to come after me. Now in verse 25, for whoever desires. So, so here's what he's doing. He gives the principle of discipleship in verse 24. Now he expands on the principle. Now he expands on it. So he's saying, for if you desire, if you desire to follow me, you cannot let your competing desire of maintaining control over your life that you'll always fight with, you can't let that desire win. You can't let that desire win. You're going to have to make some kind of a decision that has lifelong implications. And you have to be willing to lose everything doesn't mean you will lose everything. It doesn't even mean you will die, but you have to be willing to die. You have to be willing to do it. When I was a kid, this verse reminds me of it, we used to have a saying, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. And so some kid would drop a dime, and we'd snatch it up and say, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. You know what Jesus is saying? The opposite. He's saying finders are weepers. Losers are keepers. We live in a world of keepers. We desire to follow no one. We deny ourselves nothing. We dabble in spirituality from time to time, but not so much that we go overboard. I don't want to be like a Jesus freak or something. You know, I'll, like, I'll go to church with you, but don't expect me like, to read the Bible and stuff all the time. And, like, pray. And, like, every day of my life. Okay, then. You want to you gain control? You will lose it all. 
But if you are willing to lose it all, you'll discover that you gain everything. 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 And one day, according to verse 27, God will review every life and reward each life or rebuke it. I want to close with a paragraph that I took from a book I've had for years. One of the first books I bought as a young Christian was a book called Disciple. It was all about this concept. And it was written by a South American pastor named Juan Carlos Ortiz. Did I say it right? Okay, good. So Juan Carlos Ortiz, and uh, he's from Argentina, and he's, he was dealing in this book with the text in Revelation when Jesus spoke to the church of Laodicea and said, um, I wish that you were cold or hot, but because you are neither cold nor hot, but you are lukewarm, I will what? I'll sp- once said vomit or spew or spit. Same difference. So he, this is what he writes. Excuse me for this illustration, but it comes from Jesus himself. What things do we vomit? Things that won't digest. If something is digested, it doesn't come back up. Vomited people are people who refuse to be digested by the Lord Jesus Christ. And digestion means getting lost. You're finished. Your life ends. You are transformed into Jesus. You are unmistakably associated with him. Here in Argentina, we have very good steaks. Let's imagine that the steak comes to my stomach and the gastric juices come along to dissolve it. And they say to the steak, good evening, how are you? And the steak replies, fine, what do you want? Well, we have come to dissolve you, to transform you into Juan Carlos. And suppose the steak says, oh no, wait a minute, it's enough that he ate me, but to disappear completely? No, no. I'm in his stomach, but I want to stay steak. I don't want to lose my individuality. I want to maintain my steak citizenship. So there's a fight. Suppose the steak wins, and the gastric juices let him remain a steak in my stomach. Very soon, that steak will be vomited out. But if the gastric juices win the fight, the steak loses its personality and becomes me. Before I ate the steak, it was an unknown cow behind the hill. Nobody paid any attention to it. But now, because it's dissolved, it gets to write a book. Imagine what your life might become if you decided, I'm going to be completely transformed and dissolved into Jesus Christ. I I desire to follow him, and I'm going to deny myself, take up my cross. I'm going to follow him, and I'm not going to let the self-life dominate me. I'm going to let him dominate me. And every, every battle that I go through, that I deal with in the flesh to get to that point will be worth it because of what God will do through your life. Father, thank you for this very short but very upfront and plain description of what it means to follow Jesus Christ, to be a disciple of his far more than just somebody who assents intellectually, somebody who just believes secondarily, but somebody who is wrapped up completely in the identity of Jesus. Lord, you're calling us to that lifestyle, and I pray that we would be men and women that not only desire and not only decide but by your grace, by your spirit, are dissolved so completely that your work gets done through us in the purest possible way. We are just ourselves. We are just fallen humanity. But, Lord, you have chosen the foolish things and the weak things because you're all about transformation. You're not looking for perfection. You like working on the old junkers, the old beaters. 
the, the 57 Chevys that are all rusted up, but you, you have restoration in mind and you have, the, you have the show in mind when we're gleaming and perfect in glory. So Father, use us. Drive the car in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this special service from Calvary Church. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Email us at mystory@calvarynm.church. And just a reminder, you can support this ministry with a financial gift at calvarynm.church/give. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Calvary Church.